And that's really all there is to mastering. Hey there, fellow music creators, Andrew Southwark, GeneraStudios.com, here to teach you how to make better music and help you achieve your musical goals. Now in this video, we're gonna be talking about how to master your own music. And before we get into that, I wanna just describe what mastering actually is, because I think a lot of people have this perception that it's this kind of black magic thing, or this black box, where a lot of mastering engineers are very specialized, they might only do mastering, they might have all this kind of crazy external gear that's very expensive that they route your music through, and people are intimidated by that. And also they don't necessarily share all that knowledge and it's kind of hard to find like books on mastering music. They do exist, but it's harder to find than, for example, mixing or composition or producing. And to put it very simply, mastering is essentially the final thing that you do to your track before you release it. So if you think of your overall project, you have your kind of composition, writing, chord progressions, melody, that kind of stuff. And then you go on to your recording, sound design, sound selection aspect. And then you go on to mixing where you work on individual tracks or groups of tracks to kind of get the compression right, get the EQ right, make all the tracks gel together, make the song sound balanced. And then finally, you have what's called mastering. And mastering is working on the actual whole track. You're working on the master bus or you're actually routing the entire track through external gear back into your computer. And what's also a part of that is exporting the track in formats that you're actually going to use to send to the stores like Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, or sending it to a company that's going to be making CDs or whatever you're releasing your song on. Well, you can't replace an experienced mastering engineer with decades of experience. Uh, it's, it's hard to find people that work in your own genre. And sometimes if it's a lot better just to do it yourself than it is to find someone, let's say, that works on metal songs than to than hire them to do your EDM track, it might just be better to do it yourself because the, the genre to genre difference can be huge. For example, in something like pop, maybe pop's a bad example, maybe like country, or uh, acoustic rock or something, you want a very organic sound. You want things to sound natural. If you're working on pop music and EDM, you want it to be very squashed. And if you're working on metal, you know, it's, it's a, even then it depends what kind of metal and it also depends what kind of EDM. So it is very genre dependent. So I have my computer set up, I have my Disney shirt on, let's go. All right, and we're in. So this track here is called Burn. I released it, I think last month or something like that. Um, but I, I took off all the mastering stuff that I did to it and this is just the mixed version. So I'll play a little bit of it just so you kind of get the gist. All right, so that's the track. So you might have noticed that the track sounds pretty good already. And this is very important that mastering won't make a bad mix good. Uh, you know, you need to have all the things before mastering good if you want your final track to be good. Mastering will make a good mix great, but it won't make a bad mix great. It might improve it a bit uh, because you're 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 doing a lot of things that make that sound more pleasing to the ear. So it might make the track be perceived better, but it will not fix a bad mix. So it's important to have that all figured out. And if you want me to cover that, feel free to let me know in the comments and I'll dive through the mix of this song so you can see the things I did to kind of get it ready for mastering. And as I mentioned, it's going to be my method of mastering. There's a lot of different ways you can master a song in the box or on the computer. So don't feel like you have to use the exact softwares I use. You can do everything with just stock Ableton or stock Logic plugins. But what I typically do is the first thing I insert on my chain is Ozone. And a lot of people know Ozone as the kind of cheating mastering tool because there is kind of an easy mode. There are presets and you can go in and you can click in and find whatever genre of music you make and you can put it on and it might sound pretty good. And actually just to test that out, I'll put on one of these presets so you can hear what it does. So this is off. And this is with the preset on. And it does a pretty good job, so keep that in mind. Now, Ozone is a great tool because you can go in and do these kind of easy modes, and there's presets for each individual module. But the thing is, you want to learn from it. You don't just want to use the presets. You want to, if you're going to use the presets, use them to learn. Pay attention to what they're doing in them, and kind of dissect what you can do to make them work for your music. So I'm going to default this back to its original state, and there's a couple things that I add. But first, let's just go over what comes when you open up Ozone 8. You get an equalizer, dynamics, and a maximizer, and that's really all you need. So really what this comes down to is EQ, compression, and limiting. And that's really all you need for a master, and you don't necessarily even need EQ. So the first step I always do after I open up Ozone is in this EQ, I will get the first band, I'll put a high pass on, 
and I'll brick wall it and I'll bring it down to about 30 hertz or so. And the reason for this is you don't really hear anything in that range and you don't really want just a bunch of low rumbles that can, you know, your speakers can reproduce them depending on what speakers you're listening on, but you don't hear them and they can clash with other things. So I just get rid of them entirely. And the next thing I do is I go into dynamics. Now you can go in and you can set up everything from scratch, but I've found that there's a preset that gets kind of like 90% of what I want. So I tend to click modern dynamics and then that's my base. So now what next thing I do is I find a section of the song that's the most, like the chorus or something, the highlight of the song. And then I'm gonna click play and click learn. You see all those sliders jumped around and they found their spaces. Now I do a little tweaking in this sometimes. Sometimes this sub one will go down to like 99 and I really want it at about that 180 hertz region because I want it to encompass the entirety of the sub. I don't want it to, to be like half of the sub because I want to treat the sub differently than this mid range here. And the next thing I do is I look at each of these bands and I see what kind of compression is just happening right off the bat from this preset. And then what I'm going to do as it plays is I'm going to tweak the uh, threshold of each of the bands until it's something that sounds pleasing to my ear and isn't too intense as far as the compression goes. The last little thing I did is I hit solo so I could actually solo the sub and I do that typically only for the sub because I want it to be like a very even sound but I want it to have that kind of pumping vibe so it's hard to hear the sub uh, you know in terms of dynamics when you're listening to the whole track so that's why I solo it and I don't necessarily solo the other bands so at this point that's most of what I do if I hear anything that's off you know in terms of like the the timing of the dynamics or if something's too aggressive I might go in and change the limiting like in here the limiting was kind of aggressive and the compression was aggressive so I pushed it up and in fact they had the ratio set as one to one so I increased it as one to five so in fact the original preset the compression wasn't activated at all but I wanted to make sure my sub was very like tight I guess it's very very it's actually being like squashed appropriately and you might have noticed as I was tweaking those sliders around I went to like an extreme point I went to a subtle point and then I just kind of honed in on what sounded good to my ears and that was very obvious when you heard some of these high frequency areas that it at first it was squashing the highs too much and so you like it was almost like putting a filter on the high frequencies so as I brought that back to a more reasonable place or less intense amount of compression it made it a lot brighter and a lot more my original mix was intended to sound like so next we're going to go to the maximizer or the limiter and this is what i think a lot of people overdo now in terms of spotify they tend to set a mastering standard of minus 14 luffs db and you don't really have to worry about that too much you can play your whole song so you can like click play at the very beginning hit the learn and have it play through the whole thing, and then unclick the learn, and it'll set everything appropriately so that it's minus 14 luffs. But I don't actually recommend you do that because if you have it exactly at minus 14 luffs, you might be under under limiting your song, and it won't sound good. And you don't want that. It'd be better to have your master be a little bit too loud for Spotify, and then just have them turn down the track. What you really don't want to have happen is for them to or for you to produce a track that's not loud enough and then Spotify to bring up your track because when they do that, they're actually going to be applying extra limiting and you don't really know what they're doing. So it's better to have it be too loud, but appropriately. So I typically go at around like minus 10 to minus 12 Luffs dB. And I don't necessarily pay attention to it when I'm done. I'll listen to it with, with a meter on, maybe not inside of Ozone. I might use another meter. Um, but I do it just as kind of sanity check, and I also use loudness, loudnesspenalty.com, which is a free tool. You upload your track, and it tells you what the penalty is going to be. So 
So that's about the stage that I personally like it. Uh, when I moved it down a little too lower, it sounded too squashed. And when I moved it down too far, it didn't really sound like the whole track was pumping together. And again, I mentioned that you you want you don't really have to pay attention to the minus 14 luffs thing too much. But one thing that's very, very important is that if you're not paying attention to the minus 14 luffs, you want to make sure that your ceiling is at least minus 2 dB. In fact, I would do minus 2.1 and make sure you turn on true peak. And the reason for this is when Spotify and other stores get your track is they're going to have to convert it from one file format, probably wave to whatever they stream in. And there's some kind of degradation of quality. And if your volume's like peaking the very top limit of that, that's the place where it's most likely to introduce artifacts into your master. So if you if you, you can get another meter and put it on after whatever you're putting on in your master, and that will tell you what the peaks are, maybe more accurately, but I just put it down to minus 2.1, put true peak on, and that's what Spotify recommends if you're going louder than the minus 14 dB luffs. Don't worry too much about these options on the side. They're kind of more advanced settings, but just click them, listen to them, see if you notice a big difference, and experiment with them. The thing that I do notice that can make a big difference is the slow to fast value, and that's just controlling how fast the limiting is kicking in. And just, you know, use your ear. It's not super critical to have any kind of value. Just play with it, and you'll notice that the way your track kind of pumps as the limiter is activated will change because you're changing, like, how fast that limiter is pumping with your track. So, you know, it's a subtle difference, definitely, but it is a difference, so just play with that knob. All right, so now we're going to add some more advanced mastering stuff that you really shouldn't dabble with unless you're perfectly happy with your master at this point. So typically in Ozone, it's very easy to do this. I add an exciter and I add an imager, and I put the exciter after the dynamics, and I put the imager before the limiter. And the reason why I do that order is because I want the imaging to happen after the exciting because I actually do mid-side processing in the exciter. So in the exciter, really, this is just do everything by ear and make sure you don't overdo anything. I'm just going to play the track, and I'm going to tweak some of the knobs, and you're just going to you're going to hear what the difference is. And it's very subtle, so it might be hard for it to come across in the YouTube uh, streaming audio format, but um, I'll, I'll try to overdo it at first, and then I'll dial it back. Super hard. Now what I do is I go into the sideband and I actually play with this uh, big, beefy kind of mid-range frequency. And I learned this trick from uh, Big Jer. I've talked about him before. I'll link to him in the description. Uh, it's a very cool trick and it makes gives your track a lot of like side sparkle. So I'll just kind of mess around with that. And again, it's important to mix it in so that you you like can just barely hear it and then take it down a little bit just so that it's it's there. It's making a difference, but it's not obvious. Oh, also another big important thing. You also want to do the learn function here and also in the imager. Um, but in the imager, there's a couple things that are very important. I think the most important thing for EDM, electronic music, that kind of thing, is to get your bass or your sub range. And you'll see here in the polar sample, that it's got a little bit of stereo width, and that's kind of bad practice for the subregion. So what you do is you actually just grab this and drop it down. So I'll click play. So that's kind of the difference between having like a very laser focused mono bass and having kind of a wide bass. And you notice that it by itself it sounded very cool, but the problem is when you have multiple notes like a kick drum and a sub bass, and if there's any kind of overlap in there, um, it can cause issues in terms of phase cancellation, especially when you're playing your music out somewhere like a club or a festival or something. You can take care of this ahead of time. Uh, you notice that it was already pretty narrow and it probably would have been fine to leave it by itself because when I was in my mixing stage, what I actually did is I got all of my sub frequency instruments like kick 
in the actual sub, and I put a utility on them and made it so that the bass below a certain frequency, probably like 150 or 180 hertz, was in mono. Now, typically what I do for the rest of these knobs is I actually just apply kind of a common thing. I make that the highest band has the most amount of stereo spread and a little less and then a little less. That's really all there is to mastering. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you'll probably like this other video too in my top five music production tips to write better music. And this video on the bottom is whatever YouTube thinks that you'll enjoy. And if you made it this far in the video, you'll probably like my other content too. I upload every single Tuesday and Friday. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell if you want to stay notified every single time I upload a new video. See you later.